You are dismissed to Sunday school now, and as the kids go, I have a question for you. How many of you took a shower this morning? Okay, last night's good. Uh, any, you know, anybody last night, too? I mean, I guess we should offer some grace. I mean, we did set our clocks ahead an hour last night, so you get a free pass. If you didn't have time to shower before church today, hopefully you took one last night, but just in case, if you did, just... You know, sit in the back and don't raise your hands during worship when you're sitting. <laughs> well, when I was in junior high, uh, I forget whether it was seventh grade or eighth grade, I went uh, with my class on a class trip to Virginia. And uh, we were visiting uh, what was known as the Virginia Triangle, not the Bermuda Triangle, the Virginia Triangle, Yorktown, Jamestown, and Colonial Williamsburg. And, uh, you know, seeing all those important places in American history and stuff. And while we were on that trip, we stayed, of course, in a, in a hotel. And it was my first time staying in a, in a hotel uh, without anyone from my family, my parents or my grandparents or anyone like that. You, you know, the people who uh, could make me take a shower. <laughs> So there were four of us to a room, and for whatever reason, my junior high brain, and I'll be the first to admit, as someone who continues to work with youth, that junior high brains don't always work so good. Um, my junior high brain thought it would be a horribly embarrassing thing to take a shower. I don't know why. So I didn't. I did brush my teeth. And I did change my clothes, but I didn't shower for the whole week-long trip. So we were, gone. we were gone for four nights, and again, I didn't shower. Not once. Wasn't too bad for the first day or two, but junior high boys, you know, they have bodies that are going through changes, and some of those changes involve, you know, hormones that cause you to stink, if you don't shower, and over time, well, you know what happened. I started noticing that I couldn't get my hair fixed right anymore. Uh, yes, there was a time when I had hair. It was all parted in the middle and feathered back and stuff. I had, I had a mullet at one point, but I haven't been bald my whole life. And I just couldn't get my hair to do what I wanted it to do anymore. You know, I had hair that was a little more naturally oily than some of the other guys' hair, and after a couple of days, I just couldn't get it to fix right anymore. And then on the van ride home from Virginia back to Ohio, I started to notice a smell emanating from me, from my armpits. So I rode most of the way home with my arms tight against my side, trying to keep the smell in, you know, when you... When you haven't bathed in a while, all the deodorant in the world is useless against that stench. Well, when I got home, I headed for the shower. And I'm pretty sure Mom took my duffel bag with all of the clothes in it and just burned the whole thing. <laughs> but when I got out of the shower, you know, I ran a brush through what at the time was my luxurious hair, and it did exactly what I wanted it to do. And my armpits didn't stink anymore. I was glad that the cute girls weren't in my van, but it was still embarrassing when everyone's running around hugging at the end of the trip, you know, because you get kind of close and I'm up there trying to hug them. <laughs> but I learned a lesson that night. Regular showers lead to less stink. Now, I know, it's not rocket science, but junior high boys are most definitely not rocket scientists. When I was little, I could skip a bath or shower or take one every other night or show, so, and I didn't stink, and I could still comb my hair. But as I got older, that wasn't true anymore. I found out I needed to shower and regularly. Well, several years later, I became a youth pastor, and I realized I needed to teach that same lesson to junior high boys over and over and over again. Dude, you stink. Take a shower. Never had to have the same conversation with the girls. They got it. 
But I eventually did start making the you have to shower regularly conversation a part of mission trip orientation meetings, hoping to head the problem off before it got bad, you know, on a 90 degree day in inner city Cincinnati on day three of the mission trip or something like that. Well, sadly, there are a lot of people who are well bathed on the outside. Their hair and skin are nice and clean and smell nice, but, but on the inside, not so much. And the truth of the matter is, we all need to be bathed in grace. We all need a spiritual bath just as much as we need physical ones. You know, Jesus once accused the legalistic rule-making Pharisees who opposed him. He accused them of being people who cleaned the outside of the cup, but left the inside dirty. Okay. Of course, no one in their right mind would do that, right? Of course, teaching junior high boys to do the dishes, you might see the same thing. But we all know that if the inside of the cup isn't clean, the cup isn't clean. Regardless of how nice and shiny the outside is, it's the inside that matters. He was using that as an illustration of people who focus on looking really nice on the outside, focus a lot on their image and on what people think about them and on how they're perceived by others, but inside, spiritually, they're dead and decaying. And here in America, we, we see lots of people who look nice on the outside and even, even sometimes go to church. But inside, there's death and decay. Funny thing about a bath or a shower, you can tell when someone's had one, can't you? They just look different, don't they? Well, as St. Peter writes to struggling, persecuted Christians... He encourages them to hold on to the hope of their salvation and of Christ's return. And he reminds them that this hope bathes them in grace and in the process transforms them. That shower at the end of my class trip totally transformed me. Not just in the moment, but in my orientation toward bathing in general. But then Peter challenges them and us to keep following Jesus, to keep seeking holiness in our lives, even when life gets really tough. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 13, or chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. Therefore, because of the hope you have in Christ, Prepare your, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Hope is one of the major themes of this letter. It's the thing that gives us perseverance and patience. 
the ability to hang on when hanging on is hard to do. And the only real source of hope in this world is Jesus. Look closely at verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we trust Christ with our lives, when we trust Jesus to forgive us and, and to cleanse us, that's faith, right? We also place our hope in Him. That means we are confident that He is trustworthy and that He will fulfill His promises, even the ones that haven't come to fruition yet. It means that even if we never live to see it, we know that He will one day return to this earth. Just like the prophets in the Old Testament time were, were prophesying about Jesus coming and dying for all, all humanity. And they never lived to see that moment. So those of us who never lived to see it still place our hope in the fact that Jesus is coming again. And we know that when we die, we will, we will go to be with him. And that gives us the courage and the strength to hold on today, regardless of the challenges we must face and the suffering that we have to endure in this life. That gives us hope. That's a source of hope for us. Now, even though we... Uh, 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 we place our hope in Jesus and in what He did for us on the cross and being raised from the dead and, and also in His promised return. We don't obsess about when and, and how Christ will return. Jesus made it very clear that even He doesn't know when He will be returning. In Mark 13, 32, He says, But concerning that day or, or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So we're not to focus on the when and how. We don't need to obsess with predictions of when Christ is going to return. The point is, live every day knowing that Christ will return as He promised. Could be today. Could be tomorrow. Could be a thousand years from now. The when isn't important to us. What's important is living every day knowing that He will keep His promise to return. And that is where we place our hope. And that hope becomes evident in our lives in two ways. When we are actively placing our hope in Jesus, we begin to do things a little bit differently. And First Peter tells us to prepare our minds for action. Now, Peter's actually painting a word picture here because the words he uses literally translated are gird up the loins of your mind. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, in those days, and still today in some places in the Middle East, men wore or wear what was basically a really long shirt. And it usually hung partway down their calf. It was great for day-to-day -day life and activities and protecting you from the dust and from the sun. But if they were working hard or doing something really physical, like preparing to fight in a battle or, or, or doing something like that, or even just preparing to work really hard or run, anything like that, that long Sure, got in the way. So when they needed to do something that required real exertion, they tucked the lower tail of the shirt into the belt around their waist. So then they'd be ready for action. So that little old man you see walking through Walmart with his shirt tucked into his underwear, <laughs> he's actually ready for action. No, they would... They called it girding up their loins. And what they would do is simply tuck the tail of the shirt into the belt around their waist, and then they could move more freely. That's the image Peter uses to describe preparing our minds for action. He's saying, actively get yourself ready to live in the hope that Jesus represents. He's talking about our minds having the resolve 
and the preparation necessary to face whatever life throws our way each day. And to face those things in a way that is faithful to Jesus. So when we place our hope in Jesus and His saving work and in His promised return, we prepare our minds for action. That's the first thing. And second, he says, we develop the habit of being sober-minded. Now, that doesn't mean we're always serious or depressing people. It means we have a well-balanced way of thinking and approaching the world. It means that we are able to be self-controlled. We're in control of our thoughts, and we're in control of our actions. We aren't just randomly reactionary to the things that happen around us or the things that happen to us. We are self-controlled. Peter says, therefore, because of your hope in Jesus, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's talking about when he returns. So this kind of hope doesn't just sit back and hide from the world and wait for Christ's return like a hermit. And it doesn't cloister up in a Christian's only kind of lifestyle that never interacts with the world, kind of like a monk. No. This kind of hope engages the world and lives in the world, insulated from its influence, but not hiding from it. Hope drives us not to withdraw, but to engage. You see, hope and holiness go hand in hand. Hope is the water in which the soap of holiness does its work. We are called to live holy lives in a fallen, broken, dirty world. Look at verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to one's de each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. I'll actually read through verse 17. Now remember. Remember what holiness is and what it isn't. Holiness isn't about moral perfection. That's righteousness. And only Christ is truly, fully righteous. That He gives us His righteousness as a gift of grace. But righteousness and holiness are definitely related. Holiness involves being set apart for something. Holiness, as it relates to our following Jesus and, and our relationship with God, involves God setting us apart as His children taking us into His service and asking us to imitate Him as we serve Him. Let's think about holiness this way. We often call marriage holy matrimony, don't we? There is a holiness to marriage. Not in terms of moral perfection. Anybody here married to a perfect person? No. Brad's kind of maybe raising his hand and knows he needs to. The holiness to marriage is a man and a woman setting themselves apart for each other. In the words of the liturgy that we go through in a marriage, in a wedding ceremony, they forsake all others. So sexually and emotionally and physically, they are setting themselves aside only for each other. They won't be distracted by other calls for affection. In marriage, husband and wife separate themselves from their past and, and set themselves apart exclusively for one another. That's a picture of what holiness is, and that's why we call it holy matrimony. There is a setting apart for each other. When you place your trust in Christ, you are set apart for God's purpose. 
set apart as his child, and you are called to imitate God. It isn't just the pastor and the church staff that are set apart in service to God. Every one of us is called to be holy, set apart for his service. Now, we don't like to talk much about holiness these days. We talk a lot about the love of God and the grace of God, but the truth that in Christ we are all, not just the pastor, we are all set apart as holy before God? Yeah, that one, not so much. The truth that Christ isn't just my Savior, but my Lord, and that because of that He has a claim on my life and that I belong to Him, Now, we we ignore that. Look at verse 17. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Exile there, he's referring to the fact he's calling all followers of Christ exiles in this world, acknowledging that this world is not ultimately our home then ultimately we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and that's where our first allegiance lies. But he also says if you call God Father, he's talking about prayer here. How does the Lord's Prayer begin? Our Father. He says then if you call God Father, if we say that, acknowledging that we really are God's children, then we need to realize that there will be a family resemblance. We are to be obedient children. We are to live the way He calls us to live. Now here's the thing. Most of us, when we hear that, start judging everybody around us. Oh, you know that Brad guy. He just doesn't know how to follow Jesus. You know, Greg, geez. What about that guy? I think I saw him at Buffalo Wild Wings the other day having a beer. That Brad guy, man, he watches football on TV and stuff. That Bob, geez, he listens to rock and roll music. This isn't an excuse to judge someone else's walk with Christ or their way of living with Christ. It's a command to pay close attention to our own way of following Christ and our own way of living. What do we do? We deflect it and focus on everybody else and judge everybody else. Well, they're not living for Jesus. They're not living for Jesus. They're a loser. They're a loser. They're a loser. That isn't the point. And this isn't permission to emotionally or verbally beat someone else up just because we don't agree with them about one of the finer points of theology somewhere. It's in order to focus on our own lives in Christ and follow Him as He calls us to follow Him. And in doing that, we are to fear God. You see, there's one kind of fear that eliminates all other fears. One kind of fear that is truly healthy fear, and that is the fear of God. And I think I can make an argument for fear of snakes too, but that's a different sermon. It's a healthy reverence for and awe of God. I mean, think about our call to worship today. That God has given every star its name. God has named every star in the galaxy. And how many stars are in the galaxy? Billions upon billions upon billions. More than all the number, all the human beings who have ever lived, who've ever had a name. And how often do we have to repeat names? There's more than one Bob in this room right now. Right? We as human beings aren't that creative. Every star has a name. God calls it by name. And there are trillions upon trillions upon trillions of stars. And when you look up into that sky at night on a clear night, 
Some of what we consider stars aren't even stars. They look like stars to us, but they're actually entire galaxies. So far away that they come to us as a single pinpoint of light. There needs to be some awe in our relationship with God. Moses walked with God in an intimacy that hasn't been approached before his time or since. And yet, Hebrews 12.21 says, Indeed, so terrifying was the sight of God that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now when we truly fear God and place our hope in Him, we will not be afraid of anything else. Remember, Peter's writing to Christians whose lives are on the line because of their faith in Jesus. They're being persecuted. They're losing their businesses. They're losing their form of income. When we truly fear God, we will not be afraid of anything else. No persecution. No form of suffering will cause us to quake because we live in the fear of God. And that is the fear that casts out all other fear. Now look at verses 18 through 21. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold. I was like, not with cheap stuff like silver or gold but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. Christ has a claim on our lives because He saved us. He ransomed us, Peter says. Not with silver or gold, but with His own precious blood. As precious to us as silver and gold might be, they pale in comparison to the blood of Christ. And we cannot turn away from the bloody nature of Christ's sacrifice for us. When Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, was released in Italy, the review board there gave it a G rating. And some parents objected, saying that the movie was too violent for children to watch. But the reaction of Italian author Riccardo Zaccioni, who was quoted in the, USA, in, in the newspaper USA Today, said more about theology than it did about parenting. He refused to allow his children to see the film in his words because they want them to have this idea of the spirituality of Christ. Not this idea of debauchery. He's talking about the blood. The soul of Jesus is important, not his body. And this writer preferred to have his son watch a 30-year-old film, The Gospel of <coughs> According to Matthew. And there's nothing wrong with it. that movie. It's a great film. He said, that film is very deep, he said, and you don't see a drop of blood. He planned to see the Passion of the Christ himself, but he said, I think sometimes I'll shut my eyes to preserve myself from all this blood. We want the Spirit of Jesus without the Incarnation. We want the death of Jesus without the pain. We want the sacrifice without the blood. But without the body and the pain and the blood, the crucifixion is meaningless. Well, that doesn't mean you have to watch it if you have a queasy stomach. I get that. That's not the point. The point is we cannot sanitize sacrifice. It has always been bloody. And that's the point. We were ransomed, Peter says, by the precious blood of Christ. More precious than gold more precious than silver. There is blood on the ground. It should have been mine. But it isn't. It belongs to Christ. He shed His blood so that I wouldn't have to. That's His love and grace. 
And that gives him a claim uh, to my life that surpasses all others. We belong to Christ. Hope and holiness go together. 1 John 3, 3 says, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure, as Jesus is pure. Hope and holiness, hand in hand. If you follow Christ, if you place your hope in Christ, you belong to Him. That is the source of your hope. It's also your call to holiness. Not permission to judge someone else's walk with Christ, but to pay attention to your own. You see, if we place our hope in Christ's salvation and in His promised return, and if we acknowledge then His claim on our lives, that He has set us apart for His service, we'll be drawn into a life of of love, not of division and judgment. Look at verses 22 through 25. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, not silver or gold, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of the grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. His promises hold. His promises stand. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. That Jesus came, and He lived, and He died for us, and He was raised to life, and He ascended to the Father, and that He will come again. And that is where we place our hope. Hope and holiness together. Bathe us in grace. One is the water, the other the soap. You know, at one point we had to teach our boys, dude, you can't just sit in the water. <laughs> soap for an hour. You've got to use the soap. You know, it's like, how far down do I have to break this for you? You've got to use so, but I remember when I was in middle school. Holiness leads to love of one another. How many churches have been destroyed by judgmental hearts and minds? How many lives have been destroyed because when someone who follows Jesus stumbles, they experience judgment instead of restoring grace? Maybe it's because when someone else messes up, and maybe it's bigger than our own mistakes, we don't feel so bad about ourselves then, so we, like middle school boys, we point out everybody else's shortcomings so we don't have to face our own. It's a juvenile way of thinking and being. God calls us to something higher. He calls us to restorative love. He calls us to be bathed in grace. And to allow others to be bathed in grace too. In fact, it's our job to invite them to be bathed in grace. Before he was elected the seventh president of the United States, Andrew Jackson was commander of the Tennessee militia. It was during the War of 1812. And at one point during that war, his troops' morale hit an all-time low. Things weren't going well for them, and they began to lose hope. And when that happened, when they lost hope, they started arguing and bickering and fighting among themselves. And at one point, Jackson had to call them together when the tension was reaching a boiling point, and he said to them, Gentlemen, remember, the enemy is over there. It's not right here. When we lose hope... We lose our sense of being set apart for service to God. And when that happens, we turn on each other. People of hope hang together. His promises hold. Christ will return. Our job is to live each day as if that day matters in light of Christ's return. And we're to live those days in holiness and in love. Regardless of the opposition we face, because we are bathed in grace. Hope and holiness work together. 
drawing us together in restoring love. Have you been bathed in grace? If you haven't, I'd like to offer you the opportunity to take that bath this morning, so to speak. It's not an external one. You can walk out of here perfectly dry. It's an internal bath. But I'd like to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, Today, I confess my sin and my dirtiness and the fact that I have tried to live my life my own way and I've made a mess of it. Today, today, March 13th, 2022, I ask to be bathed in your grace. <coughs> I place my faith and my trust and my hope in Jesus. I acknowledge that His blood was shed in place of mine. His precious blood. Because He loves me. And I submit myself to Your will. I ask to be bathed in grace. In Jesus' name. Thank you.